Hello engineers, today I'm going to show you how to determine the strength of the welds using steel connections. Since steel structures are made up of many members that are small enough to be easily shipped and assembled, they will require many connections. Using welds for the connections is a high strength option that can be done economically in the shop. So if you're going to be designing steel connections, it is essential that you know how to determine the strength of the welds. This video will show you the calculations to do just that. And remember, you can always visit StructuralCentral.com if you want to generate structural engineering calculations like those discussed here. Now let's get into it. For a welded joint, the stress from the reaction must be transferred from the first member through the weld and then to the next member. The strength of the joint will be dictated by two simple formulas that are found in section J2.4 of AIC 360, which is the specification for structural steel buildings found in the back of the steel construction manual. One equation is for the weld metal and the other is for the base metal. The formulas say that the strength is just the nominal stress times the area. You then need to include your LRFD and ASD safety factors to get the design capacity. Now there are a lot of details that you'll need to be aware of in order to use these seemingly straightforward equations, which I'll go over starting with the weld metal. The two most common types of welds found in structures are groove welds and fillet welds. Groove welds can be further subdivided into complete joint penetration groove welds, partial joint penetration groove welds, and flare groove welds. If you take a look at table J2.5 of AIC 360, you'll see that it includes a section for each of these weld types. If you enter the table with the weld type as well as the load type and direction, it will give you the values for the safety factor, nominal stress, and effective area that you use in the weld strength formula. To start, I'll point out that there are three cases where weld strength calculations are not required. First, for complete joint penetration groove welds, the strength of the joint will be controlled by the base metal since the weld will be strong enough for it to be considered fully developed. Second, for cases where the tension or compression is parallel to the weld axis, it is permitted to neglect the stress in that direction when the weld is designed. And finally, the weld strength does not have to be determined for columns and compression that are designed to bear. For all other cases, the safety factors and nominal stress values will each fall into one of the two groups shown. For the effective area, the table redirects you to sections J2.1a or J2.2a, each of which tell you that AWE is equal to the effective length of the weld times the effective throat. The effective throat is the shortest dimension from the root of the weld to the face of the weld. This will be the plane where the weld is most likely to rupture since it has the least amount of area, so it also has the most amount of stress. You can see here that for a fillet weld with equal length legs that the shortest dimension from the root to the face of the weld is at a line perpendicular to the face of the weld. This means that for perpendicular plates that the effective throat is equal to 0.707 times the weld size. If there's a gap between the plates, if the plates are not perpendicular to each other, or if you're using a groove weld reinforced with a fillet weld, then you'll have to look at the geometry to determine the actual controlling throat dimension. For partial joint penetration groove welds and flare groove welds, the effective throat dimension is located parallel to where the two metals touch. You have to refer to tables J2.1 or J2.2 though, since the depth of fusion depends on the weld process bevel angle, and welding position. Now that you know in general how to calculate the strength of welds, we're now going to go into more detail about fillet welds since they are the weld that you'll likely design most often and their design has several important caveats that you're going to need to be aware of. First off, I'll share with you the simplified weld strength formula for fillet welds. If you take the weld strength formula and then use the values we just discussed for the safety factor, nominal stress, and effective area, you get the following equations. You then plug in 70 KSI for the weld strength and 1 16th inch times D for the weld size. You can then multiply the five terms together and then you're left with the simplified weld strength formula. This formula really comes in handy in design since you can just quickly multiply this one value with the weld size in 16th of an inch and the effective weld length to determine its strength. For example, the strength of two 3 16th inch fillet welds using 70 KSI electrodes that are each four inches long can be calculated as shown. Now moving on, one major characteristic about fillet welds that affects their design is that their strength as well as their stiffness are not the same when they are loaded at different angles. A fillet weld that is loaded perpendicular to its axis will have a strength that is 50% higher 
than a fillet weld loaded parallel to his axis. But that extra strength comes at the cost of decreased ductility. AIC provides two equations that account for this. First is equation J2-5, which allows you to increase the nominal weld stress, which is normally 0.6 times FEXX for fillet welds, by multiplying it by this factor, which depends on the angle between the load and the weld's longitudinal axis, theta. For a longitudinal weld, theta is 0 degrees, and the factor ends up being 1. For a transverse weld, theta is 90 degrees, and the factor ends up being 1.5. Now this formula can only be used if you have a weld group loaded through its center of gravity, and when all the welds are oriented the same direction. So what do you do when the welds are oriented different directions? The AISC specification includes equations J2-10A and B, which are for fillet weld groups made up of longitudinal and transverse welds. This formula allows you to determine the capacity two ways and then use the greater value. First, it adds up the strength of the longitudinal and transverse welds, ignoring any increased strength due to the orientation of the transverse welds. Second, it allows you to use the 50% increased strength for the transverse welds, but this comes with a reduction in strength for the longitudinal welds of 15%, since their reduced stiffness means that they won't reach their full strength at the same time that the transverse welds reach theirs. Using this formula also requires your load to be applied through the center of gravity of the weld group. If your load isn't through the center of gravity, then the equations no longer apply, so you must determine the capacity using one of the eccentrically loaded weld methods that I discussed in detail in another video. The final thing you need to know about fillet welds is that their length has the potential to affect their strength. Most welds fall into the range where they do not require any adjustments in their strength calculations. For very short welds though, any flaws at the ends will have a more significant impact, so section J2.2B requires you to use an effective weld size of a quarter of the actual length when the weld length is less than four times the weld size. For end loaded welds, stress is not uniform throughout the length of the weld. To account for this, AIC tells you to use an effective length that is less than the actual length. For long welds, this is done by multiplying the actual length by a beta factor, which is determined as shown, and for very long welds, the effective length will always be set to 180 times the weld size. Now that covers what you'll need to know in order to calculate the strength of the welds. Now if we return to the two equations I showed you at the start, the strength of the welded joint may also be controlled by the base metal. It doesn't matter how strong the weld is if the base metal around it is not capable of transmitting the load to the weld. For a welded T-joint, the strength may be controlled by the base metal at any of the planes shown. The planes directly at the face of the welds, though, are not typically checked since table J2.5 requires you to use a filler metal that has a strength that either matches or undermatches the strength of the base metal. This ensures that the weld will control at these locations. To use the base metal strength formula, AIC again points you to table J2.5, which either redirects you to section J4, or provides the same safety factors, nominal stresses, and effective areas that you would find there. Section J4 is a section that tells you how to check the elements at connections. These checks include tension yielding and rupture, shear yielding and rupture, and compression yielding. For many conventional shear connections, the configuration is such that the stresses along the fillet welds are not uniform, so they don't fall neatly into one of the limit states for base metals. To handle this, it is common to just ensure that the base metal strength is greater than the weld metal strength, which can be done by using the formula shown. Remember though, that if you have two welds on both sides of the metal, like at the beam shown here, then you'll need double this minimum thickness in order for the welds to control the strength. If you'd like to see how these calculations apply to actual welded connections, you can visit structuralcentral.com. There, you will be able to quickly generate structural engineering calculations just by entering a few inputs. With its intuitive interface and live updating, you'll be able to start getting results immediately. Choose your connection type, then enter the dimensions directly on the drawing, and see the connection strength and the strength of each of the limit states right there. The program allows you to either specify the weld size or let it be determined automatically. You can also choose to provide the beam reaction, and then the program will check the connection stress ratio. Calculations are well referenced with values plugged in, just like you would write by hand. You can also move the mouse over the variables to see a description of what they are and see all other instances where they're used, making calculation review a breeze. Head on over to structuralcentral.com and sign up for free today.